Hello and welcome back to the RSET training, application of NASA Sport Land Information System Soil Moisture Data for Drought. My name is Sean McCartney and I'm an RSET trainer based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the second part of this three-part webinar series. The following slides will provide an overview of the training, application of NASA Sport Liz Soil Moisture Data for Drought. According to the World Health Organization, an estimated 55 million people globally are affected by droughts each year. Traditional drought applications and indices focus on sensible weather and precipitation trends and their impacts on the hydrologic system. This training is focused on the introduction of the NASA Land Information System, or LIS, output of soil moisture at various depths for drought analysis and monitoring. Soil moisture plays an important role in drought monitoring. LIS output of soil moisture will enable a more efficient drought analysis via a gridded product at relatively high spatial resolution, resolution as opposed to sparse in situ measurements of weather parameters and even less dense soil moisture and vegetation health in situ observations. The spatial tracking and analysis of soil moisture by LIS provides a unique tool for those monitoring drought locally compared to large-scale traditional indices forced by weather factors. After participating in this three-part training, a user will be able to apply LIS output to efficiently analyze drought over large spatial areas in conjunction with current practices and to integrate this capability with existing data. The training learning objectives are to identify the NASA LIS basics regarding the framework, input forcing, static fields, land surface modeling structure, and output most relevant to drought. Summarize the derived soil moisture percentile products and how these are created. Apply sport LIS output and or derived products to both complement existing data and overcome limitations to monitoring drought over large areas. Recognize best practices for LIS impact related to drought. Configure LIS output file for viewing within a GIS-based display tool and for tailored output products and graphics. The prerequisites for this three-part training are the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, Session 1. You need to download and install QGIS and all accompanying software. You must register for a Google Colab via Gmail or a Gmail-enabled account and basic Python experiences beneficial but not required. Over these three weeks, there will be three one and a half hour sessions, which will include presentations, demonstrations, and question and answer sessions. All materials and recordings from each session are available on the training webpage. In part two, the focus will be on early and established applications of LIS for drought analysis in operations. Following each session, there will be a self-paced micro-lesson which will not be graded but serve as a knowledge check and prepare you for the following parts of the webinar series as well as the final homework assignment. There will be one homework assignment which, we, which will be posted on May 31st with a due date of June 14th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Listed below are the trainers for today's webinar. Christopher White is the Applications Integration Meteorologist with the National Weather Service and the NASA Sport Program based in Huntsville, Alabama. Richard Heim is a meteorologist with NOAA's National Center for Environmental Information based in Asheville, North Carolina. Corey Davis is an Assistant State Climatologist in North Carolina's Climate Office. And Barrett Smith is a senior service hydrologist at the National Weather Service in Raleigh, North Carolina. The objectives for this first part, for the second part of the webinar series, are as follows. By the end of part two, participants will be able to summarize the derived soil moisture percentile products and how these are created and apply sport LIS output and or drive products to both complement existing data and overcome limitations to monitoring drought over large areas. Questions are encouraged. If you have any questions, please put them in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar in the order that they were received. 
Feel free to enter the questions as we go. We will try to get to all of the questions during the question and answer session after the presentations have concluded. If we run out of time, the remainder of the questions will be answered in the Q&A document, which will be posted to the training webpage roughly one week after the training. We will now go to Christopher White to learn about SportLiz early use and value in local operations. Christopher, over to you. Hello, I'm Chris White, and I'm the Applications Integration Meteorologist with the National Weather Service Office in Huntsville and the NASA Sport Program. I want to thank you for your time and hope you find this presentation informative as a part of this NASA RSET training series on the list for drought course. So the training objectives here today uh, will be an introduction to the United States drought monitor process, a little bit of an introduction to drought and drought analysis, then understanding applications of soil moisture and the sport lane information system for drought analysis, understanding the importance of communication and the research to operations and operations to research or R2O-O2R process, which really in this module involves the creation of the sport list soil moisture change and percentiles data. And then also understanding drought analysis from some early use cases using soil moisture data specifically from the sport lists. So a little bit about the drought monitor process. Input to the U.S. Drought Monitor, hereafter USDM authors, is handled each week via emails through the USDM email listserv. Who provides this input can vary from state to state and within broader regions. Within states, it is often provided by a state climate office or some other designated entity, but may come from multiple sources at the local level, such as the National Weather Service offices or other agencies, regional offices such as the regional climate centers or national weather service regional offices may additionally provide input as necessary also it's important that this information about all of the usdm example graphics you'll see in this presentation are stated here uh, the u.s drought monitor is jointly produced by the national drought mitigation center at the university of nebraska lincoln the united states department of agriculture and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This map and following USDM maps are courtesy of the NDMC. So how does the USDM process work? I'll speak mainly from my own experience here at the National Weather Service Office in Huntsville. Each week, the State Climate Office in Alabama sends out an email with drought designation suggestions to the USDM author and notifies other relevant parties in the state along with outside coordinating members in the region. Individuals from these various agencies or groups, including my own, can add supplemental input for their respective local areas based on their own analysis and areas of expertise. In some states, however, it should be mentioned that drought analysis and suggested changes to the USDM may take place through coordinated routine discussions via virtual meetings. At the National Weather Service, level in general, input will typically be provided directly back to the state climate office or to a higher level designee in that state or region or directly to the USDM author. Engaging in this process and upon learning about the high resolution, low latency sport lane information system soil moisture data set in 2011, the National Weather Service office in Huntsville began incorporating these data routinely into drought analysis. So what is drought? Well, that can actually be complicated and there are potentially many definitions, but you will hear elsewhere in this training series, drought can be considered as some imbalance between water supply and demand and is dependent on the location and the time of year. That is both the supply and demand of water relative to what is typical for that time of year and location is necessary for drought analysis. This demand may not be solely due to human needs and activities, but what is also required by the flora and fauna of a region, although some of these types of data can be difficult to come by. Nevertheless, drought can be difficult to define. The listener is encouraged to visit where they can hear more information about drought at drought.gov. 
So now let's get into some of the different hydrologic components of drought analysis. So just as stated, water resides in different components of the hydrologic system, such as rivers and lakes, soils, groundwater, snow and ice, and glaciers. The availability of these water sources can vary in importance from region to region and throughout the course of the year. For example, water storage in snow and glaciers can be important for downstream locations that have access to these water sources upon some melting process. But of course, it's not important in areas that don't have access to these water sources. Additionally, physical storage systems for water can respond differently to weather and environmental phenomena and inputs of water. These factors can complicate the drought analysis process as different natural water storage systems may have varying imbalances in water supply versus demand. For example, soil moisture may be relatively high from recent rainfall, but storage in lakes and res reservoirs may be relatively low after a long period of drought. Thus, the USDM works on a principle of convergence of evidence regarding the state of drought. Nevertheless, this module will focus on water storage in soils and how this information can be an important component for drought analysis. While reasonable estimates of precipitation amounts are available from rain gauges and remotely sensed sources such as radar, determining how soils are responding to these precipitation inputs is often difficult to gauge due to a lack of direct soil moisture observations. After all, some rain doesn't go into soils, but can be immediately converted into runoff. So assessing water storage and availability in the soil system is what is ultimately important for that component of drought analysis. Complicating this, however, is the variety of soil types that may exist across an area, which have different characteristics regarding water infiltration and capacity. For example, clay soils have better moisture retention but slower rates of infiltration than sandy or silty soils, which can lead to greater runoff under similar precipitation conditions. Factors such as infiltration and runoff, in addition to evaporation and evapotranspiration, add further complication to the task of properly assessing water storage in the soils. Fortunately, the land surface model within the LIST framework can account for these variables of soil type and weather phenomena. As indicated previously, in situ soil moisture data from ground networks, such as those from the USDA DA scan sites, shown here to the right, for example, can be spatially sparse. However, these data can be very valuable for assessing soil moisture at their point locations, but also when precipitation and soil types are relatively homogeneous across an area. Sources of other modeled soil moisture from the CPC are valuable since they are in terms of ranking percentiles but data images available for the common user can limit effective analysis on small or sub-county scales. However, all of these data can be used in tandem to assess soil moisture and convergence of evidence from different data sets. Now let's take a look specifically at soil moisture as a component of drought analysis and the application of sport list data. Some advantages of the sport list over existing data led to its adoption as an additional tool for soil moisture analysis in the Tennessee Valley. This is an example soil moisture plot as they appeared on the sport website during initial uses of the data, which is actually similar in appearance to images still available today. The image displayed here represents the column integrated or zero to 200 centimeter relative soil moisture over the Southeast Conus domain. The image on the right depicts the zoom over the state of Alabama. These and other list data are updated every six hours with loops of hourly images for various domains available. Three hourly data are distributed through the Southern Region Local Data Manager for display in AWIP's two workstations at National Weather Service field offices. Importantly, notice that the three kilometer resolution of the imagery allows for evaluation of soil moisture on sub-county scales. In this example, notice the variability of soil moisture in the enlarged image of Coleman County, Alabama. This degree of resolution is especially useful for drought monitoring purposes, since drought designations in the US drought monitor can cut across county lines. 
in this module, we will look at a couple of cases where sportless soil moisture data were used at the Huntsville National Weather Service office, specifically for drought monitoring purposes. We'll also learn a little bit about the evolution of sportless output to provide for a more effective soil moisture and drought analysis. To get a more complete picture of drought conditions, one must determine how soils are responding to precipitation input or the lack of input as indicated earlier. Take this recent example from April 26, 2023. This graphic shows the amount of precipitation that fell across the continental US or CONUS during the seven day period ending at 12 UTC on the 26th. These precipitation data are from the multi-radar, multi-sensor precipitation data suite, which is also the short-term precipitation forcing for the sport lists, encompassing about the prior three to four days. Notice that the amount of weekly rainfall was highly variable across the CONUS, but you will observe a gradient in precipitation across portions of the southeast U.S. So how would soil moisture respond to the rainfall or in areas that experience the lack of rainfall? Let's take a closer look at this region to observe the precipitation amounts along with responses to soil moisture. Now, zoomed into the southeast CONUS and centered on Alabama, let's take a look at the weekly precipitation across the region. Notice that rainfall exceeded or exceeded 75 millimeters or about three inches in some portions of eastern Arkansas with gradually lighter amounts to the east. Across portions of northern Alabama, precipitation generally totaled around 20 to 50 millimeters or about 0 0.8 to 2 inches. Farther south in Alabama, amounts trailed off with little to no rainfall occurring in portions of southern Alabama and adjacent areas. So how would soil moisture respond to the rainfall or in areas that experience the lack of rainfall? Now we can look at the weekly precipitation in the graphic on the left compared to the one week change in soil moisture in the graphic on the right. In the soil moisture change graphic, it's important to point out that soil moisture decreases are depicted in warm colors, while soil moisture increases are depicted in cool colors, such as the greens you see in this example. First, we'll consider the total column or zero to 200 centimeter relative soil moisture, which is shown here. During this period across the region, soil moisture increases per the one week change data were generally confined to areas with rainfall amounts upwards of around 25 millimeters or about one inch. Notice that precipitation did occur in some regions in which the sport list shows soil moisture losses over the one week period. Even delineating areas that had between 15 to 25 millimeters or about 0 0.6 to one inches of rainfall as shown here we can see that soil moisture values fell in some areas over the weekly period. Thus, soil moisture doesn't increase just because precipitation occurs, especially when spread over a one week time period, of course. However, when considering more shallow layers, such as the 10 to 40 centimeter layer shown here, the soil moisture responses are different. If we look again at the 15 millimeter threshold, Notice that in this layer, soils show more of a positive response to this input of precipitation, which makes sense given the smaller volume of soil. Thus, it can be important for the user to understand these types of differences and the relative importance of layers for their analysis. Shallower layers are more responsive to inputs of precipitation, while deeper layers will have a slower response. Now let's take a look at an early case where the soil moisture products were used for drought analysis. During April 2012, drought conditions had gradually developed across much of northern Alabama, and by May 1st, moderate drought conditions extended across much of the area, as seen in this USDM depiction. Abnormally dry or D0 conditions existed across much of the remainder of northern Alabama, for this section of the module, however, we're going to apply focus mainly for southern portions of DeKalb County. During the following week, May 1st through May 8th, 2012, rainfall totaled around one to two inches across much of the region, with lesser amounts of rainfall scattered in various locations, including parts of northeastern Alabama. 
However, the questions remain. How is soil moisture responding to the rainfall given factors such as evaporation and soil type? And to what locations should I focus my attention? A look at the list data helps to answer these questions. The list graphic on the left shows the 0 to 10 centimeter volumetric soil moisture percentage on the morning of May 8, 2012. Notice the relative dryness of 0 to 10 centimeter soil moisture, mainly in southern portions of DeKalb County, Alabama, as highlighted by the box. At this point, let's zoom in so that we can pay closer attention to this area. The data show that soil moisture values there were lower than in adjacent areas to the north that already held a moderate drought designation, as depicted in the USDM image on the right from May 1st. Not only was the soil moisture relatively low in the shallow 0 to 10 centimeter layer, but was also low in the deeper 0 to 200 centimeter layer, as shown in the image now on the left. Despite the rains of the previous week, the relative soil moisture weekly difference plot indicated that soil moisture had likely decreased a few percent during the week. With the knowledge that this is a corn producing agricultural area, and this was a crucial period in the early stages of the corn's development, a phone call was placed to a field office agent of the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service. The agent confirmed that the soil moisture was dry for that time of year and that the corn crop was beginning to become adversely effective in this area. Offering all of this information to the state climatologist and the USDM author, the decision was made to include this area in moderate drought with the next update valid for May 8, 2012. Now, this may not seem like a significant use case, but there are some takeaways from this example. The three kilometer resolution of these sport lists data did allow for decision making abilities on sub county scales, as was shown. Since drought designations can be sub-county resolution, data that allow for this type of precision are preferred. Also, the list data allowed for an efficient assessment of areas that were most likely being impacted by recent dry conditions. Essentially, the data serve as a valuable situational awareness tool, providing an important component for drought analysis. Of course, there are many other factors that must be properly incorporated into an analysis, such as stream flows, precipitation estimates, and reservoir levels, just to name a few. It is also important to analyze data within the context of climatology. However, soil moisture climatology and associated percentiles data were not available at this time for the sport lists. Thus, comparison of soil moisture values across the area, along with their corresponding drought designations, provided evidence for drought expansion in this case. Additionally, the all-important input from the Ag Extension Agent's report on soil and crop conditions provided an important climatological context for soil moisture values. Nevertheless, the need for climatological context and historical data were needed for a more thorough drought analysis within the sport list data suite. So it's important to take a moment here to mention the positive nature of the R2O and O2R process and how this led to additions to sportless output. The sportless was initially developed as a land surface data set for local regional modeling efforts, while the use of the data as a tool for drought analysis came later. Feedback from data users for drought applications indicated a desire for soil moisture change values and graphics as we've already seen displayed in this module. This eliminated the need for users to flip back and forth between newer and older data images as shown here in this example from late June 2012. Since the drought monitor is updated on a weekly basis, one week changes in soil moisture layers were requested and eventually generated, but other time period changes were eventually added. Soil moisture change data are especially useful for situations where some evidence is beginning to point to a needed change in drought designations. For example, let's say we have a situation where some of the evidence was trending towards a D1 drought designation, but the decision was made to hold off until next week's drought issuance to see if evidence from other data sources began to converge. Soil moisture change data the following week can provide for an efficient analysis about whether soil moisture values decreased further while also showing the magnitude of their decrease. 
Feedback from users also indicated a critical need for soil moisture percentiles data for proper drought analysis. After all, as mentioned previously, drought relates to water supply versus demand based on what is typical for that place and time of year. Thus, climatological context was needed with regards to soil moisture values. Additionally, many other data types used for drought analysis are in terms of percentiles or comparisons to normal values. Due to this feedback, the SPORT modeling team worked to produce a soil moisture climatology and percentiles data as outlined in part one of this training series. Although SPORT list soil moisture percentiles were not available in 2012 during our previous case, the climatology that would be developed later indicated hindsight support for the drought designation on May 8, 2012. As shown here, according to the SPORT list, 0 to 200 centimeter soil moisture percentiles were around the second to fifth percentile over DeKalb County, Alabama at the time. After their eventual production and availability, these data became important for drought analysis, which leads us to our next case. April 2016 was the beginning of a period of drought that would eventually worsen across portions of the southeast through the summer and fall. This is shown in this USDM depiction over the USDA Southeast Climate Hub region. Notice the D0 and D1 designations in this region and locations where no designations were made. On April 26, 2016, Sport lists 0 to 200 centimeter relative soil moisture values ranged from around 40% in portions of the Piedmont and Atlantic coastal plain to around 50 to 60% across much of the Tennessee Valley region. However, put in terms of climatological percentiles, what appeared to be relative low soil moisture values in the coastal plain were not actually very low from a climatological perspective. Soil moisture percentiles were low across much of the Tennessee Valley region, stretching northeastward across the Appalachians, as is shown here. For this case, though, we're going to zoom into Alabama and surrounding areas. Taking a closer look, notice the sport list was indicating 0 to 200 centimeter relative soil moisture around the 10th percentile in some areas of northern Alabama, with climatologically drier conditions farther to the northeast. Corresponding areas in northern Alabama carried a D0 USDM designation, but it's important to remember that drought is multifaceted with other important hydrologic data considerations. Additionally, soil moisture is typically among the first components in the hydrologic system to experience reductions in water due to environmental factors such as evapotranspiration, relative humidity, and solar insulation, just to name a few, while storage in water and in other systems such as rivers and reservoirs will typically evolve on slower timescales. So, soil moisture can be an important early signal about the development of drought. Interestingly, if we look at 28-day average streamflow percentiles, which is commonly used as a component of drought analysis, over northern Alabama and adjacent areas, we'll see that values were in the 25th to 75th percentile for much of the area. Although, percentiles ranging from around the 10th to 24th percentile can be seen in drier areas to the north and northeast, with some indications of climatologically low streamflows present in far northeast Alabama. This serves as a reminder that climatologically dry conditions will often manifest first in soils versus streamflows. Thus, soil moisture can serve as an early indicator of the potential development of drought. However, it's important to learn and understand the behavior of moisture increases and decreases in the hydrologic components for your specific areas of interest. As relatively dry weather lingered then into May, soil moisture conditions continued to deteriorate. From May 3rd to the 24th, as shown here, a gradual decrease in soil moisture was accompanied by a corresponding expansion of drought designations. By May 24th, values below the 30th percentile had spread across much of northern Alabama, but were even as low as the 2nd to 5th percentiles in some areas, as shown by the black ovals here. These very low percentile values were associated with sandier soils situated along aptly named Sand Mountain in northeast Alabama. 
All else being equal, these soil types will typically lose moisture at faster rates. Remember the 28-day stream flow percentiles on April 26th? Well, these had decreased quickly to values in the 10th to 24th percentiles by the end of May. Likewise, soil moisture percentiles decreased significantly during this five-week period. Taking a closer look at the soil moisture values, by May 31st, following a week of generally hot, dry weather, zero to 200 centimeter soil moisture values below the 20th percentile became widespread across northern Alabama, with values below the 5th percentile in many areas. Taking stream flows, soil moisture, and other data sets, such as the standardized precipitation index shown here, into account, and evidence from drought indicators on May 31st converged towards designations largely in the D1 to D2 category. Notice that indicators were highest in the soil moisture and SPI indicators and where drought conditions had persisted the longest, which was in Northeast Alabama. A D2 or severe drought designation was made for the first time during this drought event with these indicators provided as evidence to the USDM, just a little more than a month after D0 conditions were present. So this example can help to, help to illustrate the all-important convergence of evidence when considering drought categories. So there are some important items to mention here. The drought analysis is a complicated process. Not only is convergence of evidence important, but discussion and consensus of opinion can be a part of that process. The focus of this lesson was largely about soil moisture and how it can fit into an overall drought analysis. However, other factors may have more relevance at times for your situation. This lesson focused on specific soil moisture variables that were available and used for analysis at the time. Since then, other soil moisture variables that address water availability in the root zone are available and should be considered for use. These would include the zero to 100 centimeter level, which is often used for drought analysis. However, other more shallow layers are available, such as 10 to 40 and 40 to 100 centimeters. Please visit the USDM About webpage shown here to see valuable information about the USDM and the process to create drought designations. Some key takeaways before we depart. The drought analysis, well, as we Mentioned several times, it is a multifaceted process with an emphasis on convergence of evidence and coordination with other groups. Soil moisture is important for analysis because, well, soils are an important source of water in the hydrologic system. Precipitation may be measured reasonably well, but some is converted into runoff or goes quickly back into the atmosphere through evaporation. What eventually goes into soils can be measured by in situ or remote instruments or estimated by land surface models, such as the sport lists. Additions and changes to the sport list data suite took place because of intentional R2O and O2R activities, emphasizing the importance of the process for data application and product development. Sport list data were shown to be effective as a tool for drought analysis, especially with regards to drought development. Although not shown in these examples, understanding specific layers important for your analysis is crucial in any sort of proper drought analysis. So I want to thank you for your time. Again, this was Christopher White with the National Weather Service and the NASA Sport Program. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher, for the great overview of operationally applying soil moisture data for drought monitoring. We'll now go to Richard Heim to learn how the U.S. Drought Monitor incorporates sport lids with existing data and methods. Richard, over to you. Hello, I'm Richard Heim. I'm a meteorologist with the NOAA National Centers for Environmental Information and also a U.S. Drought Monitor author. I will be talking about how we utilize the NASA Sport LIS drought product in the weekly U.S. Drought Monitor operational product. I also use it in my monthly NCEI State of the Climate Drought Reports. In this talk, I'll be setting the stage for the USDM by going over a background and the USDM methodology, reviewing drought indicators with a focus on soil moisture, 
and providing an example or two of how USDM authors utilize the Sport LIS soil moisture product. Drought is basically the imbalance between water supply and water demand. Water supply is essentially precipitation. Water demand in nature is evapotranspiration and potential evapotranspiration. Soil moisture is basically a storage term. Excess precipitation goes into runoff. We have good measurements for water supply and water demand, but until recently, soil moisture estimations were not as good. The Palma Drought Severity Index was developed in 1965 as the first index to assess the total moisture status by incorporating water supply, water demand, and a soil moisture component. It became the official drought index for the US and many areas worldwide. Some deficiencies were discovered over the years. Other drought indices and indicators were developed beginning in the 1980s and 1990s. The US Drought Monitor was developed in 1999 as a composite index that incorporates the strengths of everything that has come before and after. The US Drought Monitor, or USDM, is produced manually every week using ArcMap, which is an ArcGIS product tool. Drought is expressed in terms of recurrence intervals, that is how rare a drought magnitude is, and mathematically it's expressed as percentiles. D0 is an abnormally dry category, and D1 to D4 are the four drought categories. The USDM incorporates dozens of drought indices and indicators, some at multiple time scales. These inputs are best expressed in terms of percentiles so that they can be related to the DX categories. The USDM also incorporates impact information provided by a network of hundreds of state, regional, and local partners. A distinction should be made between the responsibilities of state teams versus the responsibilities of the USDM authors. The USDM authors prepare a national map based on national data sets that show current drought conditions. State drought teams assess conditions in their states based on state data sets and national data sets and can make recommendations to state agencies and governors for drought response actions. We look at all available data when preparing the US Drought Monitor. The indicators can be grouped into six broad categories, soil moisture, stream flow, remotely sensed data and indicators, snow, which is most important in the Western US, other derived indices, such as the Standardized Precipitation Index, Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index, and Palmer Drought Severity Index, and expert local input. The indicators include indices and indicators based on precipitation, evapotranspiration, snowpack, stream flow, groundwater, soil moisture, reservoirs, vegetation-based indicators, and so much more. These include in situ station data, remote sensing, and model data. The Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, is a measure of water supply and is based on precipitation. The Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index, or SPEI, measures both water supply and water demand and is based on precipitation and temperature. The SPI and SPEI are especially useful since their values are expressed in standardized units that are directly related to the USDM DX percentiles, and they have a long period of record. The USDM uses a convergence of evidence approach, and that is, what are most of the indicators from each of the data categories saying? What are most converging to? We focus on the relevant indicators and timescales for the location, time of year, and climatology being examined. For example, soil moisture conditions are crucial in the warm season or growing season in the agricultural lands east of the Rockies. Soil moisture conditions are not that important in the cold season or dormant season, especially in northern states where the soil is frozen in winter. Another example, mountain snowpack is crucial for western states in the winter and spring, but snow is not important for eastern states in the summer and there's practically no snow at all in the southern states most times of the year. An example of the convergence of evidence is the Ohio Valley in late February 2023. The sport soil moisture percentile products were depicting extremely dry soils for this time of year compared to the sport history 
across a large part of the Ohio Valley. Some of the other soil moisture indicators depict a dry conditions in the Ohio Valley, and these include things such as NLDAS, crop chasma, and grace, but they were nowhere near as bad or extensive. Other soil moisture indicators depicted barely any dry conditions in the Ohio Valley. These include SMOS satellite data and the VIC and CPC leaky bucket models. It was unusually warm in the Ohio Valley for February, but evapotranspiration is low in the winter anyway. Precipitation data showed that the last one to two months were nearer to wetter than normal. None of the other soil moisture indicators showed conditions as bad as sport did. And local data from state drought teams in Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio showed soil moisture conditions normal to wet. It was later determined that there was a problem with the input data to the sport model, which led to the unusually dry conditions in the Ohio Valley in February 2023. So this example illustrates the importance of consistency between indicators, and that's basically the convergence of evidence approach. It illustrates that soil moisture is less of a factor in winter when temperatures are low, evapotranspiration is low, and vegetation is mostly dormant. And it also illustrates the importance, the important role that state drought teams play in the USDM process. So in conclusion, the Sport LIS soil moisture product is an important tool in drought monitoring, but like all tools, it should be used wisely. There are three broad types of soil moisture data used in the USDM, in situ observations, satellite data, and model data. Examples of each type include state MESOLNET observations and USDA NAS assessments for in situ station data. SMOS, GRACE, SMAP slash CROP CASMA as examples of satellite data and NLDAS, VIC, CPC, Leaky Bucket, and SPORT as examples of model data. The units that the soil moisture data are expressed in are very important. The best units are percentiles expressing soil moisture content related to the local historical record. But most mesonet soil moisture stations don't have a long period of record, so percentiles can't readily be computed. The next best are units that relate the soil moisture to history, for example, above, below, or near normal, or that are related to moisture needs of vegetation or crops. Units like volumetric water content by themselves are of little use for USDM drought monitoring. The units have to have real world meaning. The next several slides are an example of how the sport soil moisture product was used to expand and intensify drought in Arkansas on the September 20 and 27 USDM maps. On the September 13 USDM map, there was some abnormal dryness and moderate drought, D0 to D1, with some severe drought, D2, in spots in Arkansas. And if you look at the precipitation history, Arkansas was dry statewide over the time periods from the last seven to 30 days. There were some wet and dry areas in Arkansas at the two month time scale. It was dry statewide at three months with the driest areas occurring in central Arkansas. And it was dry over the four month period, but it was wet at the six month time scale. And this wetness earlier in the year skewed the longer term SPI indicators so that they showed conditions that were not very dry. Some of the drought indicators did not show really bad conditions, but others did. Stream flow, for example, was normal. Vegetation did not seem too stressed based on the veg dry and the VHI indicators. Temperatures were warmer than normal during the summer, but not excessively so. However, the last week or two in September saw a severe heat wave over Arkansas, which rapidly increased evapotranspiration and drying soils, leading to what is called a flash drought. Here is some text from the September 27 USDM narrative that discusses the impact of the short-term heat and dryness. 
The U.S. Department of Agriculture offices nationwide report on soil moisture and crop conditions in each state. The USDA NAS reports had 58% of the top soil moisture in Arkansas dry to very dry on September 18, but that number jumped to 88% of the state on September 25. So people were seeing the soils drying out in their on-the-ground observations. The KBDI showed an increasing fire risk, reflecting the impact of many days of no precipitation. Some soil moisture indicators were showing rapid drying, but others, the VIC and NLDAS models, for example, were not, at least not at first. The dry soils were not reflected much on the GRACE soil moisture indicator, and that's the bottom left two maps, but they were showing up on the SMOS indicator, and that's the map to the right. Rapid drying of soils was seen from mid-September to late September in the crop chasma topsoil and subsoil moisture products and in the sport soil moisture percentile maps, especially in the shallow layers. Reports of dried ponds from Arkansas ranchers confirmed the dryness. Ground truth like this is crucial to telling us what is really going on in local areas. The sport LIS soil moisture percentile maps show us the degree of drying in four soil layers. The top layers reflected the greatest amount of drying. The sport product captured the rapid drying in Arkansas in September 2022, best of all, of the soil moisture products. The lack of rain and very hot temperatures, which increased evapotranspiration during the last half of September, rapidly dried soils. The USDM depiction showed rapid expansion of D2 severe drought across central Arkansas and the introduction of D3 extreme drought into the west. The sport product captured this very well and was an important tool behind the USDM drought expansion. So in summary, the Sport LIS Soil Moisture Percentile product is a valuable addition to the suite of soil moisture products used to prepare the USDM. Its percentile units are directly related to the USDM VX categories. The Sport product provides information for multiple soil layers. The shadow layers, 0 to 10 centimeters and 0 to 40 centimeters, enable detection of rapid drying of soils, which happens during flash droughts. The deeper layers, 0 to 100 centimeters and 0 to 200 centimeters capture relic dryness from past dry periods. But like all drought indicator products used in the production of the USDM, the sport product's utility is most effective when it is consistent with other products. This illustrates the convergence of evidence approach of the USDM. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Richard, for the great overview of the U.S. Drought Monitor and the convergence of evidence approach for using different soil moisture indicators, especially the utility of sport soil moisture in the U.S. Drought Monitor. We'll now go to Corey Davis and Barrett Smith to provide a state-level perspective of using sport Liz from North Carolina. Corey, over to you. Hello, my name is Corey Davis. I'm an assistant state climatologist at the North Carolina State Climate Office I'm joined today by Barrett Smith, who is the Senior Service Hydrologist at the National Weather Service in Raleigh, North Carolina. And today we wanted to share our state-level perspective about how we're using sport list data in our own drought monitoring process in North Carolina. So what we hope you'll get from our presentation today first is an understanding of how we are using the sport list products uh, in our weekly state-level drought monitoring process. Uh, to do this, we'll share a couple examples of specific events where uh, we found the sport list data especially useful. Uh, so we'll share how we use that data alongside our other drought indicators. And then finally, based on our own experiences, we'll share our recommendations and some best practices for using the sport list soil moisture data if you're doing any uh, local or state level drought monitoring in your area. So first, just to give some background on the drought monitoring process in North Carolina, uh, there's a group called the North Carolina Drought Management Advisory Council, or DMAC, that under state law is responsible for doing drought monitoring and drought assessment and issuing drought advisories for all 100 counties in the state. Uh, you can see on the left here some of the organizations that are involved in the DMAC. It's mainly groups that are measuring drought conditions or observing drought impacts. 
and every week we'll get together with them on a call uh, where we'll go over recent weather conditions, especially recent precipitation, some other drought indicators, including the sport list data, and then also impacts observed across the state. All of that informs the recommendations that we make to the U.S. Drought Monitor that are ultimately reflected on maps like you, the one you see at the bottom right here uh, for North Carolina. So what data, what indicators are we using as part of our drought monitoring process? Again, it all starts with precipitation, uh, but we're looking at more than just what's fallen over the last week. We actually look at several different time scales ranging from short term, which is really anything within the past 30 days, uh, including medium term, which is anything from the past one to four months or so. And then in the longer term, which could be four months all the way up to a full year in the past uh, to see weather conditions are showing as wet or dry across different parts of the state. In order to do that, we often look at data in terms of a percent of normal. And again, that helps highlight those areas that have been a little wetter and drier. And as you can see in these three maps from last summer, uh, there can be differences across these time scales. Uh, this was a case where some areas were wetter in the short term and drier in the longer term. And as you've already heard uh, during our presentation uh, session today, uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor authors want a convergence of evidence. And this is where some of the other indicators come in to help show us where those dry conditions are actually happening. That's where we found a lot of value with the sport list data, especially being able to look at the soil moisture percentiles over different layers. Uh, that includes uh, the, the shallower layers, like a zero to 40 centimeter, all the way down to a deeper layer, like a zero to 200 centimeter. Uh, this is really just a good way of showing us uh, how deeply entrenched dry conditions are within the soil. Uh, because we're doing our drought calls every week, it's also useful for us to see uh, what's changed over the past week to two weeks. And to do that, we'll use the relative soil moisture change maps that you see on the right. Again, those are just showing us whether conditions are drying out or improving across different parts of the state. On our drought calls, we're also looking at surface water and groundwater conditions. Uh, this is data coming from stream flow gauges and major reservoir operators and groundwater wells across the state. And, and this data is usually presented uh, in terms of historical percentiles for each specific location for that time of the year. And again, that's able to tell us whether things are wetter or drier than they usually are uh, in those areas. Uh, this is also really useful for us to see whether drought is affecting water sources and water supplies all across the state. And then we have all this great objective data, but it's really useful for us to be able to verify and validate that with actual on the ground impact reports. And we've got several different report sources that we use on our drought calls. One of those is a citizen science program called COCORAS. Uh, it has a network of precipitation observers who measure rain in their backyards uh, all across the country. And it encourages them once a week or so to look around their surroundings, see if anything looks wetter or drier than normal, and if it does, to submit a report. And we review those reports on our calls every week. Uh, in North Carolina, wildfire occurrence is very closely tied to drought. So on our drought calls every week, the North Carolina Forest Service uh, shares uh, fire danger conditions and fire activity that's been happening all around the state. And of course, we know agriculture is also very vulnerable to drought. So we review condition reports from farmers and extension agents on our calls every week. Uh, this includes things like crop progress and soil moisture. So uh, for instance, a farmer may report in that the soil is too dry to do any planting. And we can compare that with the sport with soil moisture data and see if they're telling the same story uh, for those areas. So across all of these data sets that we look at, we have several common needs. One of those is having good high resolution data so that we can see at a very fine local scale exactly how wet or dry conditions are. For many years, it was tough for us to find a good soil moisture product that offered this sort of resolution. But over the past five or six years, we've been using the sport list data and it really has offered us the best coverage of soil moisture data of anything that we found. Also, as you saw, we looked at multiple time scales on our precipitation data sets. And then multiple levels, like with our soil moisture data. Uh, I often say that drought is not just skin deep. So even after a rain event, uh, if the surface level topsoils are moist, uh, you can still have some drier conditions as you go deeper. So again, having those deeper layers available from sport lists is useful for us to see where drought uh, really is firmly entrenched. It's always useful for us to have data framed in terms of those historical percentiles uh, because those fit with the U.S. Drought Monitor's classification scheme. Uh, and as you see in the map on the right here with the, the, the soil moisture percentile data from sport lists, it is put in terms of percentiles, 
and it's even color coded based on the drought monitor categories. So at a glance, it's really easy for us to see where the driest conditions are and what categories they correspond to. Finally, we like having good independent data sets. And by that, I mean data that's not coming from the same sources. Uh, for example, a lot of our precipitation indicators are using radar-based precipitation estimates, but we know that Sport List is not using that same source. So if those products and some of our other indicators are all showing dryness and they're coming from different sources, that gives us even more confidence that those areas truly are dry because they're not subject to the same biases uh, that any one source may have. So at this point, I wanted to shift to our first example. And for this, we'll go back to the spring of 2022, uh, specifically the month of March. So this was coming out of the winter time and heading into the spring season. To set the stage for this, we had been drier than normal across most of North Carolina uh, over the winter before that. You see on the map on the right here, most of the state had had anywhere between 50 to 90 percent of their normal precipitation between December and February. Uh, but during our cool season, during that time of year, uh, a little bit of precipitation can go a long way at alleviating drought and drought impacts. Uh, we had several rain and snow events during January of 2022, and that slow soaking moisture into the ground really did help to improve uh, a lot of the drought and dry conditions across the state. You see in the drought monitor map at the top here that we had widespread moderate to severe drought in early December. And then just three months later, as we headed into March, uh, we only had one small area of moderate drought right along our southern coastline. But this really leads into the challenge of this specific example, which is uh, because we have uh, limited impacts uh, over the winter time because of things like lower water demand and cooler temperatures. Uh, once we head into the spring, it's tough to us, for us to see exactly uh, how well established and how severe drought is uh, across different parts of the state. So in this example, we'll walk through the month of March week by week and show exactly how the sport list data really did help us uh, know exactly where those dry conditions were at. So on March the 1st, or on our first drought call of the month there, what we noticed on the relative soil moisture map that you see on the left here in the zero to 100 centimeter layer is that there was part of southeastern North Carolina showing fairly dry soil moisture conditions. Just to give you a geographical reference, uh, this is right along where Interstate 95 runs through eastern North Carolina. It goes through the city of Fayetteville, which is pretty much right in the center of the circled region here. And on the western side of this region, that's our sand hills. That's where you find places like Pinehurst, the golf resort. So uh, these areas have very sandy soils. That soil does tend to dry out a little bit more quickly. So it wasn't too surprising for us to see some dryness here, but we also noticed that uh, that dryness was not in the area where we had drought uh, on that drought monitor map. Uh, again, those drought conditions were a little further to the south and east. So in this case, on the 1st of March, the, the, the sportless soil moisture really just called our attention to an area that was drier than maybe we expected. Uh, by the following week, we started to see some on the ground reports that backed up the dryness that we were seeing on the sport list product. And again, uh, very local variations are always possible. You won't always see this sort of close agreement. But in this case, we did have good agreement, which gave us more confidence in our assessment. Uh, there was a condition monitor report from just south of Fayetteville that noted somebody was working in their vegetable garden. The soil was very dry there. That sandy soil did not have many clumps in it. And again, that backed up what we had seen now for two weeks on the sport list soil moisture data. By the middle of the month, finally some of our shorter term precipitation indicators were beginning to show dryness in these same areas. Uh, in this case, we had less, less than 50% of the normal precipitation uh, over the previous 30 days uh, in this same region that the sport list data had been showing as dry uh, now for three weeks uh, in March. With that said, not all of our indicators were showing dryness here. So we didn't have that full convergence of evidence that we had wanted in order to make changes on the map. That really started to happen the following week on March the 22nd. In this case, some of our more medium term precipitation indicators uh, were showing dryness here. Uh, also some of our stream flow and other water supply indicators were showing dryness. So that did give us the evidence that we needed to expand uh, drought westward, really pushing it right up to about Interstate 95 where it goes through Eastern North Carolina. And again, the same areas that sport lists have been showing as dry now for uh, the previous four weeks. And then finally, by the final week of the month, again, still seeing dryness in these same areas. They did, had not had a lot of rainfall in March. And it, this is the time of the year when we expect our trees and vegetation to leaf out uh, and green up. And because of the dry conditions in these areas, that green up was a little bit behind schedule. Uh, this is often when we see uh, our springtime fire activity 
And because that green was a little behind, we did see fires in this area. There was a large fire uh, just south of Fayetteville. And then when saying this, I'm not encouraging you to use the sport list data to tell you where wildfires will happen. Uh, but in this specific case, we knew that the sport list data in this time of year uh, did correspond well to environmental conditions uh, that might favor fire activity. So that's how we made that connection between soil moisture and the greenness and the, the fire danger uh, that we had seen on the ground. So just to wrap up this first example, again, the sport list products gave us a really good indication coming into the spring of 2022 of exactly where those driest areas were in the state. It really, this was the first product that told us about the dryness uh, in that southeastern area. Because of that, I think this really highlights a good value of sport lists and giving some early warning of where those dry conditions are at and where you may see uh, some flash drought or very quick onset drought emergence. And then finally, in this case, the soil moisture data aligned very well with uh, the observed impacts, uh, both from those citizen science reports and also from where we saw that fire activity later in the month. So at that point, I'll hand it over to Barrett Smith and he'll cover our second example and our conclusions. Hi, I'm Barrett Smith, Senior Service Hydrologist for the National Weather Service in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'll be taking a look at our second example, which is the fall of 2022, and more specifically the impacts of Hurricane Ian as it crossed North Carolina on September the 30th of 2022. After a period of wet weather in July of 2022, the eastern half of North Carolina began to dry out with many areas receiving uh, around 50% of normal or less rainfall. Those areas with the driest conditions uh, can be seen here in the darker oranges across northeastern North Carolina. Taking a look at the U.S. drought monitor from September the 27th, uh, we can see that northeastern North Carolina had been dry enough to be classified uh, as being in moderate drought or D1. While the rest of North Carolina, eastern North Carolina was abnormally dry, or in D0. Hurricane Ian moved through North Carolina just three days later on September the 30th and brought widespread rainfall to nearly all of North Carolina with many areas that were abnormally dry receiving over four inches of rain. The heaviest rain fell across northeastern North Carolina and those areas that were in moderate drought or D1 received anywhere from six to eight inches of rain. Before getting further into the sport list, soil moisture products and drought classification, we think it's important to, to keep in mind that in heavy rainfall events, not all water infiltrates the ground due to runoff. So our precipitation based indicators, such as uh, the percent of normal rainfall, which we reviewed in previous slides, can make conditions seem wetter uh, than they are sometimes. All right, so knowing that the drought classification and the amount of rainfall that fell during Hurricane Ian, let's take a step back and look at some of the conditions leading up to Hurricane Ian. Once again, the 30 day rainfall prior to Hurricane Ian indicated less than 50% of normal rainfall across most of Eastern North Carolina. Soil moisture at both a shallow layer of zero to 40 centimeters on the left and a deeper layer down to 100 centimeters in the middle showed percentiles well below 10% over a large area. Uh, we should note here though that the percentiles suggest a drought classification much worse than abnormally dry or moderate drought. But other indicators at this time did not suggest drought any worse than moderate drought or D1. However, the takeaway from this is that soil moisture uh, is very dry um, over a large portion of eastern North Carolina. Moving ahead one week to October the 4th, after the passage of Hurricane Ian, uh, we can see that there was considerable improvement in the zero to 40 centimeter moisture on the left across much of the state. This is not surprising given the widespread four to eight inches of rain that fell. However, if we look deeper down to the 100 centimeter depth, there are still many areas over eastern North Carolina that show dry soil moisture conditions. And this suggests that while the upper soil moisture increased, it may not have made it all the way down to the deeper levels where longer term dryness was more pervasive. Moving ahead yet another week to October the 11th, uh, despite the well above normal rainfall that shows up in the 14 day percent of normal, which covers Hurricane Ian, the dry soils are starting to show up again, even in shallow layers uh, over Eastern North Carolina that were considered wet just one week prior. This is a case where the percent of normal rainfall, especially in the near term, can be perceived as wetter uh, than the observed conditions. 
Another indicator that we often look at are stream flows, as Corey mentioned. Near normal stream flows are indicated by the green dots in the rightmost image, and for the most part, most of eastern North Carolina was in the normal range. Uh, this suggests quite a bit of runoff into the streams, keeping them higher and less infiltration into uh, the soil. So how do we reconcile these differences between the soil moisture, percent of normal rainfall, and stream flow? One very useful indicator that uh, we have, and Corey mentioned this as well, uh, are condition monitoring reports, which are sent in by observers. And so this observer on October the 18th, so uh, more than two weeks after Hurricane Ian, indicated dry soil from a lack of rainfall and the need to water plants and crops again. So finally, as we look toward the end of October, uh, just less than one month after the passage of Hurricane Ian and a widespread four to eight inches of rain, uh, we can see that the dry soils uh, are covering all of eastern North Carolina again. And ultimately, we had some reemergence of abnormally dry conditions and even an area of D1 there in portions of eastern North Carolina. This animation of the zero to 100 centimeter soil moisture percentiles uh, starts one week before Hurricane Ian and it continues through the end of October around the 25th of October. It shows uh, how the very dry soil conditions improved after Hurricane Ian, uh, but did not completely go away and quickly began to drop toward the 10th percentile or lower just a couple weeks after Hurricane Ian. While the drought monitor map was free of any abnormally dry or D1 conditions in the two weeks immediately following Hurricane Ian, those same conditions re quickly returned by the end of the month. So as we try to look at all of our indicators in this case and determine how to interpret any discrepancies, in many ways, the sport list soil moisture, it gave us the steady, consistent uh, clues from week to week about where the drought might return. It essentially helped us tip the scales toward a hidden, drier scenario that other indicators uh, did not necessarily suggest. And so to summarize our second example, Hurricane Ian brought widespread rainfall to a large portion of, of North Carolina, and there was good recovery in the stream flows and soil moisture initially. Initial indications were that any drought could have been completely uh, alleviated. However, uh, the sportless uh, soil moisture products showed a different responses to the rainfall in different layers of the soil, and lingering drought uh, was realized as the deep layer soils did not respond as well to the, to the rainfall. So looking at multiple levels of soil moisture can be a better can be better than the standard precipitation indicator, such as percent of normal, in identifying where longer-term dryness is lingering, and can be an early warning sign for drought uh, emergence. Some things to watch for when using when using the sport list soil moisture: uh, it, it can be time-consuming to analyze multiple layers of uh, of products and to understand which is the most representative conditions or even the varying response times of each layer. Uh, you need to understand the soil characteristics in your area and how the sport list uh, represents those or perhaps even doesn't uh, represent them. And finally, uh, the sport list should not be interpreted as an instantaneous uh, product. Instead, it, it shows the state of soil over a, a wider time frame. <laughs> So we'll wrap up uh, with a few recommendations from our experiences using these products. Uh, look at them as often as you can to get familiar with the characteristics. We use them week to week and have learned of areas that are potentially error prone. Uh, there are other areas where the product seems to work better. Uh, be sure to use it in tandem with other indicators and seek out that verification. Uh, this is the, the convergence of evidence approach uh, that has been very effective for our drought group. And then finally, consider using it as a drought early monitoring tool. It can give you clues where things are drying out faster uh, than some other, other indicators would. Uh, and it also has applications for uh, fire and, and flooding as well as Corey mentioned. So uh, on behalf of uh, Corey Davis, um, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to this presentation. Thank you, Corey and Barrett, for a state-level perspective of using Sport Liz in North Carolina. We will now go to a summary of what we've covered today uh, in part two of this webinar series. So soil moisture analysis is important for drought analysis because soils are an important source of water and precipitation analyses alone may not account for water in soils. Drought analysis is a multifaceted 
process requiring multiple data sets and coordination, research to operations and operations to research activities are important for application and product development. Sport Liz percentiles and soil moisture change data were shown to be an effective component as a tool for drought analysis. The Sport product provides information for multiple soil, la soil layers, from shallow layers to deeper layers. And the Sport product's utility is most effective when it is consistent with other products, uh, i.e. a convergence of evidence. Looking ahead to next week, in order to reinforce what we learned today and to prepare you for part three, we have a micro lesson which can be found on the training page. The micro lesson will allow you to independently practice the knowledge and skills from today's webinar. Next week, part three will extend the concepts covered today to focus on data access at organization and individual levels. As stated earlier, there will be one homework assignment for all three parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. Homework will be made available on May 31st with a due date of June 14th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course. Below is the contact information for today's trainers, along with links to the sport webpage, RSET website, and social media. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you will sign up on the RSET listserv and social media to receive notifications for future trainings and other announcements. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. Hey, great. Well, thank you so everybody that's been posing their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, looks like we've got some good questions so far, so why don't we just jump right into it. Uh, question number one, how does the vegetation type and density influence the soil moisture? And whoever answered that, feel free to unmute and go ahead and speak up. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, if you're trying to speak, we cannot hear you, so please do try to unmute. Okay, I'll go ahead uh, and answer. So the answer is different types of vegetation can extract different amounts of soil moisture, depending on the need and availability of water by the vegetation type and the vegetation's rooting depth. So it can vary from type to type and their density across the land surface. For example, corn will extract more soil moisture than, say, a cotton crop would in similar soil types. And below are some resources from USGS discussing some of this. So uh, we do hope that you'll go and, and check out the, uh, the link. And question number two, how would someone differentiate the contribution of each type of drought, uh, soil, hydrological, and meteorological, to the general drought occurrence? Hello, this is Richard. Hi, I answered that. Uh, basically, this is differentiated through the drought indicators. The drought indicators are generally grouped into categories along the lines of the drought types. So we have soil moisture indicators, we have hydrological indicators, meteorological indicators, vegetation-based indicators, and so on. And so when you're looking at the response of the indicators in each category, you can use that to assess how much or the uh, type of drought is contributing to the general drought occurrence. It, we really haven't quantified it. It's, it's basically looking at the response of the indicators. Okay, great. Richard, thanks so much. Uh, we're question number three. To my knowledge, Sport Liz offers the highest resolution most frequently updated remote sensing soil moisture product, uh, three kilometers. Can you confirm that? And can you talk a bit about whether a person would also want to consider coarser resolution products and then provided some examples from SMAP and NASA Grace? Uh, and if so, why? Yeah, this is Richard again. <clears throat> I took an initial stab at answering this question and I see others have uh, also modified the, the answer. So I'll just read <clears throat> what we have here. 
market. Support less soil moisture products are updated four times per day with hourly output frequency. What I use as a drought monitor author is the daily maps. Some crop casma products are updated daily and some weekly. Grace is updated weekly and the AAS seeds, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, SMOS, soil moisture product is updated every two weeks. They also have one that's updated monthly and that covers mostly Canada, but the monthly one, some, uh, and I think the two week one covers uh, North America, basically. So that's the uh, US. Um, and that's, those are the ones that integrate some form of satellite uh, input. There are also other indicators, other models, soil moisture models, such as the leaky bucket, the NLDAS, the big models, and those are updated daily. So in terms of update frequency and latency of those four, that three that were mentioned, four specific ones that were mentioned, the sport list is the choice. For the US drought monitor analysis, authors prefer a convergence of evidence approach where consensus among multiple indicators is desired, not just among the soil moisture indicators, but consensus among all of the indicators, hydrology, precipitation, soil moisture, stream flow, and, and reservoirs, groundwater, and so on. So the USDM decision is not based on any one indicator. So authors consider all of the above soil moisture indicators and the others that I mentioned. So convergence of evidence is more of a factor than just a spatial resolution. Hey, and this is Jonathan Case. I'd just like to add and emphasize the fact that Sportless is not a remote sensing product in the classical sense. It's a land surface modeling output, and it does incorporate some components of remote sensing data into it, but it is a land surface modeling solution. Great, yeah, thank you so much, um, both Jonathan and Richard. Uh, question number four, what are some of the steps taken to mitigate or reduce the drought in areas once detected? I think I also uh, took a stab at responding to that. And as a drought monitor author, we don't really deal with mitigation or drought reduction. We analyze data to determine what the current status of drought is. So drought response, that's the mitigation and reduction of the impact of drought, is in the domain of state and local governments. So they decide what to do. And several states have drought response plans, and these can be accessed via the NDMC website that I indicated there. Also, the US Department of Agriculture uses US drought monitor classifications to allocate drought relief funds through their livestock forage disaster program. That's the main program that they use for drought relief. And I did want to mention that um, the response of states will vary from state to state depending upon their situation, the climatology, the um, resources that they have, the industry and communities that are in the state that are impacted by drought, uh, a, a really big response is reduction of water use, um, water restrictions, for example. But really to find out what the specific responses that you can take to mitigate or reduce the drought in areas once detected, you really need to access that website and look at the specific state drought plans. Okay, great, Richard, thank you so much for, for answering question number four. Uh, question number five, is there a correlation, uh, quote unquote conversion, between remotely sensed soil moisture and stream flow statistics? For example, 7Q10, the 10th percentile of a seven day total flow or any other end-day flow statistic. Hi, this is Jonathan Case here. I, I consulted with Sujay Kumar, the land information system author and uh, manager there. And uh, he's, there's generally gonna be a lagged correlation between soil moisture and stream flow. However, you can't easily convert or relate soil moisture or soil moisture percentile to stream flow in isolation. There's many factors that impact the, the stream flow solution, including vegetation, soil, terrain, and the shape of the basin. So therefore, routing models are typically run 
on land service model outputs in order to relate soil moisture runoff and other variables to obtain the basin stream flow at a specific uh, stream gauge location. And this is Richard, if I may add to the answer specifically about stream flow. Stream flow is um, responds to precipitation. If you have a heavy precipitation event that will increase the stream flow, that is useful for flood forecasting, flood monitoring. For drought monitoring, what hydrologists measure from stream flow is the base flow. What the amount of water flowing through the river that is not dependent upon the amount of rain that fell. And base flow in, in many streams is fed by groundwater, which is much deeper. Uh, groundwater is in aquifers, and that's at, at a depth far below what is typically monitored for soil moisture. Great, thank you, Richard and Jonathan. Question number six, within Sport Liz, can you use historical data to perform a predictive analysis? Just seeing if I can render a report to farmers on potential areas, timeframes, and dates as to when they might experience a drought. Go ahead and uh, speak to this one as well. Uh, I'm not sure who wrote the first paragraph of this response, but uh, there was some discussion about relating soil moisture values to agricultural imp impacts. Uh, and since drought implies a broader lack of water, other metrics would be needed to, to be analyzed. But having important information about crop impacts due to soil moisture could help inform those impacts in the short term. Uh, there's also the idea of, of applying a machine learning activity that could uh, in, better inform in an automated objective sense. Uh, however, the paragraph I added was that uh, we did begin generating 14-day forecasts where we just extend the sport list model runs out to two weeks uh, driven by the U.S.'s GFS forecast model. Uh, and that we've been doing that every day for the better part of the past year. And uh, we would like to enhance these predictions into an ensemble type approach uh, using ensemble model inputs to in order to depict the probability that soil moisture percentiles could drop below drought thresholds in certain areas uh, in that two week or possibly even longer uh, time frame and so right now we've been generating just simple animated gifs and i've provided a link uh, where you can access those uh, daily forecast soil moisture percentiles we would like to also generate uh, geotiffs of these forecasts so that uh, end users could underlay the geotiffs as a layer on top of other uh, indicators. Wonderful, Jonathan, thank you so much. Question number seven, can you share a published research article about this product generation? And I'll go ahead and uh, address this as well. Uh, we do have a variety of publications and I'll go ahead and uh, generate uh, uh, an inventory of those and we can provide uh, the various articles we've published in the last 10 years or so onto this Google Docs. Great, uh, wonderful. And then moving on, uh, question number, let's see, uh, question number eight, is there something wrong with the sport Liz data? I haven't been able to access the current data since late last week. I keep getting an error message that says, sorry, no data found for this product. I guess I'll go ahead and answer that as well. Uh, as Murphy's timing, if, if people are familiar with Murphy's law, we had a disk failure that occurred, you know, right in the middle of this RSET training class. So therefore we are temporarily offline with the real-time sport list output and we're getting our disk raid rebuilt right now and and uh, hopefully we'll be back up in the coming days yeah murphy has a way of striking when you never want him to 
Uh, question number nine, what are the kinds of data that you obtained from the citizen science reports and how are they integrated into the drought assessment? Yeah, this is Richard. And I classified the citizen science data that uh, is available to US drought monitor authors into two types. The first is daily precipitation amount measured by rain, gauge, uh, rain gauges that thousands of citizens across the country and it's really expanded internationally as well that are available through the Kokoros network. There's the website link there. The, and I'm a, I'm a Kokoros observer myself. The, uh, and it's daily rainfall amounts. The uh, second type is drought impacts information provided by uh, provided through the National Drought Mitigation Center Drought Impacts Reporter and also condition monitor reports and links are provided there. And this drought impacts information is typically a subjective observation of impacts. Um, the ground is cracking, my grass is brown. This is the lowest pond I've ever seen and I've been doing this farm for 40 years. Um, this stream has never been dry before and I've been here for 30 years. That kind of drought impacts information is provided by citizens through these web mechanisms. And as a uh, US Drought Monitor author, uh, I find that very, very helpful. It supplements the objective data that we have through the observation networks on the state and national levels and the satellite data and, and so on. It kind of gives a human touch to it as well. Wonderful, thank you, Richard. Uh, question number 10, is it possible to downscale the soil moisture product to be less than one kilometer? Okay, I guess we will move on to question 11. You mentioned sport Liz has characteristics associated with different areas and how it can make some areas more prone to errors. How is that so? Hi, this is uh, Chris White, can you hear me? Yes, Chris, we sure can. Okay, all right, sorry, I was having microphone issues uh, earlier. So um, yeah, I, I, I took a stab at this answer here. Um, there, uh, well, very recently, there have been some problems with the precipitation analysis inputs, the sport list. Um, this is referring a little bit to the NLDAS data set and some of the underlying uh, the CPC precipitation data sets. Uh, but for the meantime, we have switched to GDAS analyses because of this. And I'll let John uh, Case chime in here too if he wants to. Uh, but I would say also in the short term, especially uh, since the MRMS data suite serves as the precipitation data forcing uh, for about the prior current to about four days. Uh, those areas of less accurate MRMS analysis, you know, think largely the radar component of that will tend to have less accurate soil moisture data because the, the, the precipitation input that goes into it may be not as uh, accurate in say the Western United States as it would be in the Eastern United States where we have a better radar network and coverage. Uh, you know, this is also due to beam blockage and that sort of things. Um, but I'll let John chime in if he has any thoughts about this as well. Yeah, I think you did a good job, Chris, at, at answering some of the data quality issues that that we've had to deal with in Sportless. So uh, it, as a follow on, I would just mention that our future solution that we're col collaborating with and the Goddard list developing development team would be a, a multivariable data assimilation system. And a lot of by assimilating uh, a lot of remote sensing data sets that will help to correct, like what Sujay said, you know, the sleepy driver, we're going to try to correct those areas that are either data void or have, you know, potential quality issues in the forcing. And so having it, the regular data assimilation occurring will help produce a corrected solution in the system. Yeah. Hey, thanks, John. And let me also add, I, I'm, there, I don't know, there might be another way to interpret this question. I am not real sure, but um, it just says characteristics associated with different areas and how it can make some areas more prone to errors. Uh, and it also makes me just think about the overall 
drought analysis and how you would incorporate soil moisture into that analysis. Um, you know, soil moisture is going to be more applicable for some areas when it comes to drought analysis um, because of what's important as a soil moisture or as a moisture source in that region. So say again, we were going to do something, we we're going to discuss something about the Western U.S. versus the Eastern U.S. And, you know, Richard can chime in on this. He's more of an expert on this. But, you know, in the Western U.S., um, soil or excuse me, moisture storage and reservoirs and lakes and rivers uh, can be more important than, say, uh, than in soils. And so, uh, you know, overall, it, 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 it might lead to greater differences per what you may end up seeing in the U.S. drought monitor based on the soil moisture levels you have. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if you talk about that or maybe reference that in relation to errors, uh, but there can be differences in the, in the soil moisture depiction in the list versus what you see in the U.S. drought monitor. And again, importantly, it's because of the sources of moisture that are important to that particular region. Well, thank you, Chris and Jonathan. Question number 12, can you post a link to the soil layers, i.e. a map used as an input to sport Liz? Yeah, actually we, we do show that uh, soil input classification map on one of the session one recordings that I did, but we can also provide a, a graphic and image of what those soil classification uh, look like as well. And uh, if we could, Put that in the google doc or a link to it yeah that'd be great maybe we can get that before we post this to the training page uh if we can go back yeah. and add that i'm sure they Kevin awesome. fuel is also noting that it's in the micro lesson training material so that's something that everybody can refer back to so i think the micro training uh, micro lesson training materials would be the way to go Excellent. Yeah, that's a great point, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Yeah, we do hope that everybody goes and is completing those micro lessons before each subsequent week. Uh, so question 13, is there any process to predict a drought prior to occurring? Specifically, can you precede the query as knowing the probability of a drought happening before it takes place? Hence, we can take steps to mitigate the aftermath. Hi, this is Barrett. I think I can uh, help some with that. Um, in general, uh, you know, there, there are different ways that we're uh, attempting um, to provide outlooks or, or forecasts about drought or, you know, better awareness of where uh, areas may develop drought. Um, the Climate Prediction Center within NOAA uh, produces a uh, monthly and seasonal outlook, and they've also got a rapid uh, onset drought product that's in an experimental phase right now on their website. Um, so kind of drawing attention to areas that based on our sub-seasonal to seasonal forecast might uh, uh, venture into, into drought conditions. Uh, NIDAS has um, early uh, drought early warning systems dues and they're broken up by region and they try to find ways to, uh, to work more regionally to, to identify areas that might be um, in drought. And um, I, I will mention from the North Carolina DMAC perspective, you know, we, we don't utilize forecasts in our, uh, drought monitor um, recommendations. We, we cut off and only look backward, but we do use a forecast weekly uh, uh, to kind of better help us know where to look in the next week or two or even further out. So we are trying to find ways um, to be a little bit more predictive about where drought uh, may develop um, that are separate from the drought monitor process itself. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, and uh, quest of follow on to that uh, do you think that the uh, those 14 day forecast percentiles coming out of sport lists could also help you in, in anticipating the onset of drought yeah, so that's a question back at you i suppose yeah that's something that you know we as we uh, as a as the dmac in north carolina try to be better about um finding ways to to be a little bit more responsive or look ahead um i, I think that's certainly something that we're, we'll try to integrate into our process hey uh john i i could speak just a little bit about the process in alabama uh so there's a, a process through the uh a deca and the office of water resources under them there's a monitoring and impacts group that meets 
Um, it's a few times a year, uh, but as necessary, whenever drought conditions warrant. And um, probably similar to North Carolina, there's not necessarily as much of a predictive component that goes into the drought designations that are made just for the state, state group. Um, however, we do discuss uh, forecasts both from the WPC and the CPC to help inform us about when we might just need to meet next uh, as, as one example. There may sometimes be some consideration to hold off maybe uh, on a designation for deterioration in some area based on the prediction, but uh, largely those designations come from the analysis itself. Um, but again, um, those sorts of predictions might better inform us about how often or how frequently we need to meet and do we need to meet sooner than we would typically otherwise. And this is Richard, if I may add, uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor does not in consider forecasts at all. The Drought Monitor is a, an analysis, a map showing the current state of the drought as it exists as of the the valid time of the drought monitor, which is Tuesday mornings. The forecast should never factor into what the current conditions are. Of course, the forecast will affect what next week's drought monitor will be, but for this week's drought monitor forecasts are not considered. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Barrett, Jonathan, Chris, and Richard for uh, addressing and answering what I do believe is the final question that was posed in today's webinar. So as we wrap up, I do want Could to... I, this is yes, Jonathan please. here. Could I just... Uh, I, I lost audio and I'm not sure if you add, posed the question for 10 about downscaling soil moisture. Uh, we did pose that question and it went unanswered, so we moved on. But if you had an answer, please... Yeah. I, I just did, I did want to briefly address that there are methods out there where an organization's doing downscaling of soil moisture data sets using much higher resolution uh, data sets that, that could downscale a coarser resolution. Uh, one example I can think of is some of the SMAP, the Soil Moisture Active Passive uh, Remote Sensing Products, the the product itself itself is about a 30 kilometer resolution remote sensing product, but some of the higher resolution, more regional uh, satellite missions like NISAR uh, can give you a much higher resolution retrieval of soil moisture. And, and so there's been some downscaling techniques to emulate what could come out of a future higher resolution product. But I think what we could do is think about this a little bit more to provide the best answer in the Google Doc here. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And, and just for all the participants, uh, we will clean up this document, add some links to it, and we, we hope to have this uh, live on the training webpage by next Wednesday for the final part. So as we wrap up the second part of this webinar series, I want to thank all the participants, wherever you're joining from. Thank you so much for joining today. This is a, a very important topic, and hopefully for many of you, you'll be able to use some of this, um, some of the information that you learned today and a lot of the work that you're doing. Uh, as a reminder, there is a micro lesson. We strongly encourage all participants to go through the micro lesson. Not only will it reinforce everything that you learned today, but it will prepare you for the, uh, the next part of the training, which will be next Wednesday. I also wanna thank all of the guest presenters today, Christopher White, Richard Heim, Corey Davis, Barrett Smith, and Jonathan Case for joining for the question and answer session. Uh, thank you all so much for contributing to the second part of the webinar series. I also wanna thank all of the sport team that might not have presented today, but you're in the background helping prepare materials and helping get this training to be a success. So thank you to the entire sport team as well, and also to the RSET team. Uh, thank you for those that are working in the background that you might not be hearing like me today, but they've been working, uh, making sure that this, this today's training went off without a hitch. So thank you to the entire RSET team, and we look forward to seeing everybody back next Wednesday at the same time for the third and final part of this webinar series. Thank you.